you have your Bibles with you today, I invite you to join me in Acts the 8th chapter. The book of Acts the 8th chapter. Now, many of us are familiar with the story we're going to read today, but I assure you that the message is not going to be an exegesis or a verse-by-verse -verse breakdown of this story. But rather, there is something wonderful to be gleaned from this anecdote today from the Word of God. Amen. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse number 26. And then we're going to read down through verse number 39. And the King James text today reads, put it on the screen for those in house today. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he, meaning Philip, arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot read Esaias the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a dumb lamb, a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went both down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Amen. Praise God. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, once again, O oh God, we come before you at this important juncture in the service. The hour has come, the moment has arrived when the word of God must be broken for the benefit of your people. 
This is today, O oh God, that manna which is sent down from heaven for the nourishment of God's people. This is the bread of heaven. This is on paper what our Lord is to us in the flesh, the Word of God. Master, help me to deliver this message in a manner that it will bring glory and honor to your name. Help me to be effective in communicating to the people of God that which you would have me to communicate. Touch the ear, the heart, the spirit of every individual who would listen now live, those who will listen later by reason of recording. Lord, let our hearts today be open to receive that which the Spirit of our God would speak unto the church as well today as to the unsaved and those who have lost their way. Let healing, restoration, reconciliation, and salvation be poured out at this hour. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. I'm not going to preach what is probably the most common subject matter that is preached when this particular passage is generally used as a primary text. I want to take from this story the most basic of truths. I want to take from it the most important element. And that most important element today is simply this. Philip was led by the Holy Ghost to go into a desert place. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, you may feel like your life is a wreck. You may feel like your life is a mess. You may never have known God. You may have never had a relationship with God. You may be bound today by uh, alcohol addiction, drug addiction. You may be bound today by sexual addiction. You may have found yourself lost in a world and in a subculture in our society that engulfs you and it gobbles up all of your time and all of your energy and all of your emotion and yet somewhere inside of you something is crying out something's missing I need more than this and I'm here to tell you today I don't care how lost you are I don't care how far away you feel or how much you think that you are outside of God's purview I'm here to tell you today God knows where you're at hallelujah and he knows how to find you glory to the name of the Lord Whew. this eunuch was not from Israel he was not native to the land of Israel he had only come to visit he was a believer he was one who embraced the Jewish faith, not the Christian faith, the Jewish faith. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. It's always interesting to me how that this eunuch had the courage and the drive to spend the time, you know, travel in those days wasn't as easy as jumping on a plane and getting off at your destination and renting a car and living in a nice hotel while you're there and all of this. No, back in those days, man, if you were going to travel, it took a lot of sacrifice. It took a lot of effort. And here this man was working and living in Ethiopia, northern Africa. And here he traveled all the way from Ethiopia and through Egypt and into the land of Canaan, into Israel, that he might go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple. But you see, according to the law, a eunuch had no welcome in the temple. According to the law, a eunuch had no place in the temple. You may be in a place in your life where you feel like you have no welcome in the house of God, where you have no place in the house of God. Well, the Bible says, you know, that's what so many people point to, even con condemning themselves. Mm -hmm. 
This little eunuch said, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what the law says. I may not be able to walk in the temple, but glory to God, I can stand outside of it. I want to tell you today, this church and this ministry today is made up because one day this old preacher said, it doesn't matter to me if I can get in the first Pentecostal church. It doesn't matter to me if they welcome me at First Baptist Church. I don't care if First Assembly of God is interested in my coming in and worshiping with them or not. I'm going to worship God and there ain't nobody going to stop me. Hallelujah. Yes. I'll get as close as I can. Praise the name of the Lord. Oh, I want to tell you, this eunuch had made his way all the way to Israel, all the way to Jerusalem. So that he might worship as close to God's seat, as close to the Holy of Holies as he might be able to get. Couldn't get in the temple, being a eunuch. Oh, but I can get near it. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, God knows. The Word of God said, draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. That's Glory right. to God. Children, if you'll make one simple effort to get a little closer to the Lord, God has promised with your every effort, he will match it with effort of his own to get closer to you. Hallelujah. And here this eunuch was now headed home. Had he received anything special? Had he gotten anything special while he was standing outside the wall of the temple, outside the gate? I don't know. He may have felt good about having been able to at least do that much. He may be going home feeling good, but he still wants to know God. He still wants to understand the Lord. He still wants to have a relationship with his maker. And he's got the word of the Lord in front of him. And he's reading from what amounts to the book of Isaiah. And he's reading the book of Isaiah. And he must have been kind of reading it aloud. You know, some folks as they read, they don't just read it silently, but they'll read it aloud as they read. And the Spirit of the Lord leads Philip out into the wilderness so that these two individuals' paths might cross. And Philip sees this eunuch coming by. And he's driving in his chariot. He probably has a driver, someone who's got the horses, you know, and is conducting their passage. And he hears him reading from the word of the Lord and the spirit of God says, run up there, catch up with him. I want you to talk to that man. Oh, I want to tell you today, honey, God knows how to find you. And God knows how to send the right person your way to help you understand what you need to understand. To help you know what you need to know. Glory to God. It is no accident. There are no accidents in God. There are, There is no coincidence in God. There may be some people watching this video right now and you're thinking to yourself, Oh, I just happened upon this video. Oh, don't you bet on it. <laughs> don't you bet on it. Oh, I'm here to tell you the hand of God may well have been on your computer. The hand of the Lord may well have been on your hand as you we're right in that mouse this morning. But I'm going to tell you, it is no coincidence that you're here. God has something to say to you. The Lord has something to show to you. The Master wants to walk in relationship and in fellowship with you. And He's put conditions together as He did with this eunuch and Philip. So that you might find the answers that you seek. Long story short. Philip begins to talk to the eunuch. And he asks him. He's hearing what he's reading. And he said. Do you understand what it is you're reading? And this poor eunuch. He's not from Israel. 
He doesn't have a rabbi. He doesn't have a priest. He, he doesn't probably have any uh, synagogue that he's able to belong to. So many of us, we don't have churches nearby that we can go to. We don't have a pastor that we can consult. He said, I, I can't really because there's nobody to guide me in understanding it. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, guess what? You just tuned in to somebody this afternoon who has been sent by God to guide you. Hallelujah. Oh, but I'm going to tell you, this preacher ain't going to guide you to Donald Trump. This preacher ain't going to guide you to the Republican Party. This preacher isn't going to guide you to the right moral uh, attitudes and beliefs and uh, thought processes. No, that is not the message that God has given us to preach. The word of the Lord said that after the eunuch says to Philip that he has no man to guide him. Listen. He said, who is this prophet speaking of? Is he speaking of himself or is he speaking of some other man? Then verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth, listen, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him, Jesus. I want to tell you, church, there is something wrong with the church in America when our message is no longer Jesus. Hallelujah. There is something wrong with a preacher who calls himself and anointed of God to preach when the message he preaches is anything but Jesus. I pray to God so long as I live. If the Lord should let me see a hundred years on this earth, I hope he gives me the strength and the ability to preach this gospel till I draw my last breath. And I hope until my last breath, my message never alters and never changes. It never veers away from preaching Jesus. Hallelujah. In John chapter 12, verses 31 and through 33, the word of the Lord reads, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Listen, Jesus is speaking. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Then he said, this he said, signifying what death he should die. I want to tell you today, we've been called to lift him up. Hallelujah. Preacher, you've been called to lift him up. Believer, you've been called to lift him up. You haven't been called to make the gay man straight. You haven't been called to make the drunkard sober. You haven't been called to make the uh, drug addict clean. You have not been called to make the uh, prostitute moral. You have been called to lift him up. Hallelujah. If he will be lifted up, he'll take care of the rest. Hallelujah. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Oh, my Lord, Hammers, I will tell you the problem with evangelical and fundamentalist Christians. I grew up in that number, so I know what I'm talking about. The problem with evangelical and fundamentalist Christians is they think God is some tiny, skinny, weak character off in the corner of heaven who can't do nothing in the world, but he needs the church to do everything for him. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I, I hate when I hear Christians talk about God's called me to fight in his army. No, he hasn't. God no more needs you to fight for him than he needs you to breathe his air. Hello now. He doesn't need you. The word of God said 
uh, that God has declared, there is nothing that I need. Hallelujah. There is nothing that you can provide for me. There is nothing that you can do for me. I've got news for you. God has not fought you, called you to fight his battles. God has not called you to do his job. The God we serve is far more capable to do anything that needs to be done than anything you and I could ever do. Yes, yes. But we got evangelicals and fundamentalists. They think, Tommy, that if they're talking to somebody who's an unbeliever, they think it's their job to inundate that poor person, to just preach at them and stay on top of them and keep hollering and yelling and preaching and pounding until that poor person in their weakness and in their frustration finally agrees to go down to the altar. Mm -hmm. But the Word of God said... No man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. See, you'll notice that the eunuch didn't go out looking for anybody, but God sent somebody to him. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, when somebody's hungry for God, when somebody wants the right answers, when somebody wants to know what they need to know, and they're sincere in their desire, God will find a way to get the right person to them. Hallelujah. God will find a way to put conditions together that will allow that person to be properly led into the way of truth. Hallelujah. We got the problem we have is too many Christians are trying to convert folks. Listen to me now who have no desire to know God to start with. You're trying to preach people into heaven that aren't ready. You're trying to bring people to a point of conversion who aren't ready. Now, the Word of God said some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. Maybe your job isn't to lead them in. Maybe your job is just to plant a little seed, to plant the Word of God. Maybe your job is just to share a word of testimony and to water the seed that mother or dad or grandma or grandpa planted years ago. Maybe your job is not to bring in the sheave. Because, honey, if that plant isn't fully grown and if it isn't bearing fruit and it's not ready to be harvested, then you bring it in and you know what's going to happen? It's going to rot, it's going to fade, it's going to die, and it will have been good for nobody. Hmm. I'll tell you, we've got churches today full of people who were never ready to be saved who were never ready to be converted, who were never ready to receive the fullness of this wonderful message, but they had somebody who just rode them and rode them and rode them. Oh, they may come to church, but they're not saved. They may sit in the pew, but they're not converted. They may listen to the preacher, but they're not interested. Listen to me now. I grew up in the Assemblies of God. I know what I'm talking about. I saw kids whose parents dragged them to church and they'd sit there and the preacher be preaching and I'm tell I could name names right now, people I could think of, who just sat there and had a look on their face like they were a million miles away. They were no more interested in what that preacher had to say than they were cutting off their own head. I have family members. I have an aunt who left the Pentecostal church and began to go to a Baptist church because she said the Pentecostal church was too busy preaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost instead of preaching salvation. Well, first of all, you don't know the message of salvation to start. <laughs> but aside from that, she said, my husband needs the salvation message. He doesn't need the Holy Ghost. Well, tell you what, 
they want to go to the Baptist church and he wound up out of church and they wound up divorced. He never was saved. He never got the Holy Ghost. Uh, problem is, honey, you married somebody who had no interest to begin with. You think you can do job, God's job for him. You think you can lead somebody to the Lord that the Lord has not first led. Mm -hmm. But you can't. And if you could, you could prove the word of God to be false and you could prove the God of his word to be a liar. But the word of God said, no man, no man, no man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. If they're not being led of the Spirit, if they're not being directed by the Holy Ghost to a place of hunger and a place of desire, if they're not being led by the Lord to that place, then there is nothing you can say, there is nothing you can do that will ever be worthwhile in helping them to find the Lord, in helping them to find salvation. Nothing. But there are churches today full of people. I dare say churches at this hour have never been more full. But I also dare say there's never been a time in the history of the church when the church had more people in it who were genuinely unsaved and unregenerate than we do now. Why? Well, because the church has found a way to guilt people into church. They found a way to guilt people to the altar. They found a way to guilt people to a conversion uh, experience as it were. But the Word of God talks about seed being planted and scattered and how some of it falls on hard ground and some of it falls upon rocky ground and some of it falls upon thorny ground. And the problem is most of the people in the church today have hardened hearts. Most of the people in the church today have fallow hearts. Most of the people in the church today have stony hearts. The word can fall upon their heart and yet it accomplishes nothing. Because mm -hmm. they're not ready. Sure, parents, drag your kid to church. You think, well, as long as they're here in the preaching... Bless God, there's an opportunity they might choose to be saved. Nope, till the heart is ready, it's not going to happen. Oh, but you might get them to the altar because the preacher is able to guilt them. You might get them to the altar because of some emotional altar call where the preacher talks about, oh, you may leave this church today and get hit by a bus, hallelujah, and you'll die lost, honey. I've sat through so many of those emotional altar calls in my life. It's manipulation. It is emotionalism. It's not God. It may work to fill up your seats in your church, but it is doing nothing to fill up heaven. The way for the church to fill up the kingdom and not just the church houses is to lift him up. Hallelujah. Because the Lord said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Oh, we got preachers and we got Christians today who think that the first opportunity they have to speak to a person who doesn't live the way they think a Christian ought to live. They think that their message ought to be whatever issue it is that that person has in their life. I need to preach against homosexuality. I need to preach against drunkenness. I need to preach against drug addiction. I need to preach against immorality. I need to preach against a prostitution. I need to preach against sexual sin. I need to preach against this. I need to preach against. Oh no, darling. You are so wrong. You need to do what Philip did. And preach Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, 
Amen. He didn't go into some diatribe about the idolatry of Ethiopia. Oh my goodness. Phil didn't preach that little eunuch a sermon on the idolatry that was prevalent in Ethiopia. You didn't hear Philip preaching a message on the immorality of the heathens in Ethiopia. You know, when you read the New Testament epistles, you need to understand something. I wish people would just think for a minute. The Word of God, I've talked about it before, and I'm not going to go into great detail again. But we know that the New Testament is given to us by reason of divine authority. God gave the apostles the authority to establish the foundation of the church. There's a difference between authority and inspiration. The Old Testament, the Word of God said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Old Testament is fully and totally and completely inspired. The New Testament, however, is written under a different dispensation. It is written under a different anointing. It serves a very different purpose and a very different function. It is not that God inspired every word that the apostles wrote, but rather that God gave them the authority. Why did he give them the authority? Well, as Jesus was about to ascend, the word of God said, Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. You see, before the Lord ascended, he had opened the mind of the apostles so that they could properly see and understand understand all the prophecy of the Old Testament everything that related to Messiah and the coming of the Christ all of a sudden things they didn't get while they were while he was yet with them you remember at one point the Lord said I have many things to tell you but you cannot bear them now since you're not ready I'm going to tell you if more Christians would understand that you got to wait till they're ready So once the Lord opened their understanding, all of a sudden, hindsight became 2020 for the apostles. All of a sudden, now they understood things about their entire time with the Lord that they did not understand while they were walking with Him. Do you follow what I'm telling you? So now, they begin to write epistles and they begin to write letters under the authority that God had given them to establish the church in an effort to clarify some things and to make some things plain and we find the apostle Paul does a lot of writing about moral issues and about behavior and about conduct and we say well why in the world did the apostle Paul write so much Jesus didn't talk about these things the apostles didn't preach on these things in the book of Acts we don't see them preaching Messages on morality and godly living and what have you. Why did Paul write so much about it? It's simple, folks. It's really very simple. The Jews had a very specific understanding of God and, and the things related to God. You see, God had given them the law. The law helped them to understand right from wrong, light from dark, moral from immoral, godly from ungodly, holy from evil. Do you hear what I'm telling you? That's what the law helped them to understand. All the nations outside of Israel were without the law. Therefore, they did not embrace the morality and the lifestyle of goodness and they did not believe in the same sort of hospitality and generosity and goodness and charity that the people of God had been taught to embrace by reason of the law. So all of a sudden you got this Jewish leader named Paul 
ministering to a bunch of Gentiles who now have embraced the gospel, but they have no concept of right and wrong because they never ever have been in possession of the law. So now Paul is having to say, folks, there ain't going to be no liars in heaven. There ain't going to be no cheaters in heaven. There ain't going to be no whoremongers in heaven. You hear what I'm telling you now? He's trying to help them understand. See, the law is not that we're under the law, but the law has shown us what's right and wrong. And when you come to Christ, you automatically should have a desire in your heart to do right. You can't walk in relationship with God and not have a desire to do right. But they didn't know what right was. <laughs> they had no concept of right. In the heathen nations, in the ungodly Gentile nations, they pretty much followed the mentality of if it feels good, do it, you know. They, they had no moral compass. They had nothing that guided them and instructed them in proper conduct and behavior. And that's why you see so much writing by the apostles on these sort of issues. And you don't see them writing about it so much to the Jewish church as you see them writing about it to the Gentile churches. Because the Gentiles had never been in possession of the law. And although the law was fulfilled in Christ, and though we are no longer bound by the law, the law did help us, the apostle said, did help us to know sin, to identify what sin is. And therefore, as a child of God and as a believer, we want to do our best now that God has gone to such lengths to save our soul. Now that God has done so much to bring us salvation, we want to repay Him with our gratitude. We want to thank Him with good conduct. We want to thank Him with godliness and righteousness and holy living. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? My Lord, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you, but the message we preach is not the law. The message we preach is not morality. The message we preach is not a message against this or against that or against these folks or against those folks. The message we preach is to be a message that lifts Him up. Hallelujah. And it was the message of Jesus Christ that led this eunuch upon coming to a body of water. The eunuch looked at Philip and said, Here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Oh, for those of you who want to believe, baptism has nothing to do with conversion. Baptism has nothing to do with the salvation experience. Those of you who want to believe that baptism is not all that important. Oh, it's just something you do. It's just an external evidence of an inward conversion. Baloney. It was obviously part of the message that, that Philip preached. Hello now. Had to be part of what he preached because how else did the eunuch know about it? And why was the eunuch in such a hurry to be baptized? Hey, we come upon water. Hey, here's water right here. How about if you baptize me right now? I'm going to tell you, I, I look for the day when I'm pastoring a church and I'm able to be up here preaching the word of God and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and people in the pew begin to get up and make their way down to the front of the church saying, Preacher, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Do you know that's part of the vision that God gave me for this ministry? That the day would come when people would literally, uninvited, come down to the front of the sanctuary and simply say, I want to be baptized. Hallelujah. Will you baptize me? Glory to God. Oh, the message of Jesus Christ, lifting him up, exalting him, will do more to bring the lost to the foot of the cross than all the 
anti-this and anti-that messages you could ever preach. Mm -hmm. I said it before and I'll say it again. When I came into the church of God many years ago, when I first moved to Texas as a 16-year-old boy, and I began to attend Riverside Church of God, one of the things that flabbergasted me about Riverside you talk to the people and you didn't hear them complaining about the politics. You didn't hear them complaining about the party who was in charge. You didn't hear them complaining about Mr. Clinton. Or you didn't hear them worshiping Mr. Reagan. You didn't hear them talking about the leadership in Washington. You didn't hear them talking about the direction of the morality of our nation. No, the people in Riverside, every time you talk to them. All they had to say was, oh honey God is good. <laughs> oh I'm so glad I got the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad I'm filled with His Spirit. I'm so glad I know who Jesus is. And I compared that to the atmosphere up home where I come from in New England. And things were very different up there. But down here, Oh, I'm telling you, the only message that you heard coming off of God's people's lips was lifting him up. Hallelujah. Talking about the goodness of God. Talking about what God did when he saved them. What God did when he healed them. What God did when he filled them with the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm telling you, the message was so positive and so uplifting. It blessed my soul and I was already converted. Hallelujah. I saw people come into the church high on drugs and I mean high as a kite. But they didn't come in because mom dragged them in. No, mom was in there praying for them. At that very moment, mom was in the church house praying for that daughter and the spirit drew her <laughs> all of a sudden that daughter decided she was sick of the life she was living she was sick of what she'd been going through and she wanted to find out what it is mom had that gave her joy find it find out what it is mom had that brought her such peace find out what it is mom had that helped her walk in victory rather than in addiction and that young lady made her way into the church that night and I I mean she was high on dope she was as high as a kite I want to tell you a little something those people those ladies in that church got around that weeping girl and brought her down to the altar and they began to pray with her and they prayed with her until finally hallelujah God turned the wine into water and he turned the drugs into air and glory to God that girl sobered and suddenly she had a sober mind and a clear thinking mind and they asked her do you want Jesus she said yes I do and they prayed her through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave her the utterance and she never again wanted to touch drugs you know how many times I've seen people in my life Delivered from addiction, drug addiction, sexual addiction, alcohol addiction, you name it. By the power of God. And God was able to do in one minute what they had tried to do over and over and over again in rehab and could never do. My Dorothy will tell you, she said she used to be a heavy smoker, regular smoker. She said, till one day, she said, one day God got hold of me. She said, and I said, Lord, that's it. I'm putting these things down and I'm asking you to help me never ever again want to pick them up. She said, well, that was 55 years ago. I hadn't had a desire to pick one up since. I'll tell you, God can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He can do in a moment what you cannot do in a lifetime. But the way for the gospel 
to be most effective for the way, the way for the gospel to be the most powerful and to do the most it can do it must be a message that lifts him up in Acts 17 16 through 18 now while Paul waited for them at Athens his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry Therefore disputed he in the synagogues with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. Notice he wasn't out disputing with the Athenians about their idolatry. No, 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 no. He was talking to the Jews about the Messiah. Messiah's come. My message isn't anti-false God. My message is pro the true God. Hallelujah. He was busy trying to convince his fellow Jew that the Messiah, the Christ, had come. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods. Why? Listen. Because he preached unto them Jesus. Hallelujah! And the resurrection. He wasn't preaching against their gods. He wasn't preaching against their idolatry. No, he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. Hallelujah. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. And what was he seen as preaching? He was seen as preaching strange gods. <laughs> First Corinthians 2, 1 through 5. And I, brethren, Paul writes... When I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. One of the things I love about Pentecost, one of the things I love about the message that this preacher preaches, one of the things I miss, and honestly that I hate, about not having a church full of people that love God and want to experience the move of God and want to see God save people, heal people, deliver people. One of the things drives me out of my mind. I'm used to preaching in churches where we have a house full of believers. And brother, I'm used to preaching Jesus and Him crucified. But listen to me. When you preach the right, the right message, you get the right results. Hallelujah. And when you preach Jesus and Him crucified, Paul said, I didn't come to you with any message except for Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And then what did he go on to say? He said, I wasn't a fancy preacher. I wasn't a pretty preacher. He said, oh, but I'll tell you what. You people saw the power of God demonstrated and manifested before you. I'm used to preaching. And as I'm preaching, I'm telling you, you preach the right message, you get the right results. While I'm preaching, Tommy, all of a sudden, people, I, I've seen it so many times. 
people begin to stand up and worship God and all of a sudden healing begins to flow. All of a sudden people begin to be healed. All of a sudden people begin to receive the baptism with the Holy Ghost. All of a sudden people come down to the altar to pray through to the salvation experience with God. All of a sudden things begin to happen. You see, it isn't just my words that is moving people. No, the power of God is moving. And they're seeing the demonstration of the Holy Ghost in the midst of God's people. And honey, I'm going to tell you, there is nothing more powerful than being in a church that's experiencing a move of God. I've told you the story before. I'm not going to do it today. I don't have a lot of time. I've told you the story before. I preached a fellowship meeting of Spanish churches one time. There were seven Hispanic churches in New York City in Brooklyn that had come together. Seven Trinity Pentecostal churches. And they had asked me if I would be their keynote speaker for their fellowship meeting. And I was their prime primary speaker. Long story short, I got up there and I preached and by the time I was trying to close up my message, the Spirit of the Lord was moving across that congregation. People were standing up and being filled with the Holy Ghost. People were standing up and their bodies were being healed. People were coming down to the altar and I just finished my message. I was done. I went and sat in my seat. I was all done. And then I've told you how the Lord spoke to me to go out and lay hands on certain people in the congregation and anoint them with oil. And I began to do this. And, and one after another, they fell to the floor like a, like a sack full of bricks. One after another. One, two, three, went back to my seat. Went out. One, two, three, went back to my seat. Went out. One, two, three, cast demons on a one lady. The church is shouting. People are dancing. Folks are running the aisles. We've got more going on than you can ever imagine. The power of God is falling like rain. It's Pentecost all over again. And the pastor says to me after the service, I have never seen a church service like that in my life. I looked at him, and I, and as, uh, as sincere as a heart attack, I looked at him and I said, Really? See, I know better than it. It, it doesn't have anything to do with me being special. I got news for you, honey. I was a gay man when I preached that service. I was with my partner of a few years. He was in the meeting when I preached that service. It's not about me, it's about him. It's not about me, it's about the message. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. Oh my God, you lift me up, Paul said. I know, he said, I determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Then he went on to say, and it wasn't about fancy words, it wasn't about pretty sermons, it wasn't about some kind of secrets that I was revealing to you, but you saw the manifestation of the Holy Ghost. You saw the power of God in those meetings you lift him up Pentecostal churches and I'm going to tell you a little secret you're going to start shouting again you lift him up Pentecostal pastor and let me tell you a little secret you're going to see some of those old saints who haven't had a dance in their shoes for the last 25 or 30 years you're going to see them get back up and you're going to see them start to rejoice in the Holy Ghost you're going to see people start to move and dance and run in the Holy Ghost again like you did 30 years ago the only reason you haven't seen it lately is because you've allowed your message to be perverted. You're so busy preaching against these and against those. You're so busy preaching against this perceived sin and that perceived sin instead of simply lifting him up. Get back to lifting him up because I got news for you in the early days of this movement that's what they did hallelujah they lifted him up 
I'll tell you, Brother Gillum, that man was probably one of the best lifters, the, the, the best lifter-ups of Jesus that I've ever known. I, I don't think I've ever known a man who could lift the Lord up higher than Brother Gillum could. And I don't think I ever saw a church that experienced the move of God and the power of God and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost like I did Brother Gillum's church. My Lord, have mercy. Lastly today, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. In closing, the Apostle Paul writes, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you can preach against somebody's sin till the cows come home. You can preach them guilty. You can preach them under the floor with condemnation. But nothing will make them run for the foot of the cross. Like a church full of people who are listening to a preacher lift him up. And they're rejoicing and they're celebrating what that preacher is talking about. Because everybody in the room wants to lift him up. Everybody in the room wants to exalt him. Everybody in the room wants to praise him. Everybody in the room wants to give him thanks for what he's done in their life. I'm going to tell you something. You get a church that is celebrating the power of God and the move of the Holy Ghost because they know how to lift him up. And honey, people want what you've got. You can preach against them. You can preach against their relatives. You can preach against their perceived sin till the cows come home. And they're going to leave and be glad to get away from you. Mm -hmm. But if you'll lift him up, hallelujah, if you'll lift him up, he said, I will draw all men unto me. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. If you stand with me this afternoon.